Parish Relations Committee. I'm here to discuss our appointments for pastors for the upcoming 2018-19 year. Talk a little bit about the process. In the Methodist Church, pastors are appointed for one-year cycles. And the process begins um, every year with consultations between the SPR committee at the church, district superintendent, pastors, lots of conversations. Then the bishop and the cabinet meet over multiple months in order to try to best decide where to deploy the wonderful pastors we have in this conference to the different churches and decide um, where God's word would be best glorified. And when that process goes back to the Wesleyan tradition of, of circuit riding, of churches where the pastors would come in and serve for a while and then ride in to another place. So it's deeply rooted in Methodism. So for this year, this is April 22nd. It is Announcement Sunday across the conference. The announcements will be going out um, all uh, during the day today. So for our church, um, we are glad to welcome back our associate pastors, Brandon, Lori, and Brittany. Pastor Sandra is going to be appointed as a senior pastor at Cannon United Methodist Church in Snellville, Georgia. And because Sandra has had a previously scheduled um, long vacation in May, Sandra's last Sunday with us will be next Sunday, um, April 29th. And immediately after the 11 o'clock service on the 29th, we will have a reception to say thanks and to show our appreciation for Sandra's tireless and great service she's given us the past couple of years. Also, the SPR committee will be communicating via email and um, other means in the next uh, couple weeks, other ways we'll be able to say our appreciation to Sandra. Our new pastor is going to be Dr. Charlie Reed. Dr. Reed comes to us after 10 years of being senior pastor at Pasadena Community United Methodist Church in St. Petersburg, Florida. He and his wife Brandy have a new one-year-old son, Paul, and they're Atlanta natives, and they're interested in getting back here close to family. Um, his Sunday, first Sunday with us, will likely be July 1st, and that's because of timing differences between the Florida Conference and North Georgia. And it also goes to something I wanted to explain is the vast majority of you, I presume, saw this announcement via email earlier in the week, which is very unusual. But what happened was, is because of the timing and because of a video that Charlie did about leaving and then some social media things, it got out early in the public that Charlie was going to be the new pastor here at Johns Creek. And just to be fair and just to do the right thing and just settle all rumors, um, the bishop and Sandra and the committee decided that we wanted to go ahead and send out that email. Just wanted you to know why it was done email and not done the traditional way, which is how I'm doing it now. Changing pastors is a spiritual process. It's about focusing on the church and about what we mean to being members of the United Methodist Church. And we're going to be calling for prayer and some spiritual things during this transition time when you hear more about that. But for now, please keep Sandra in her prayers for her new appointment and keep Dr. Reed in his prayer and our prayers for his appointment here. And I'll close with thinking about, this makes me focus on, and I think we all should focus on, what is the church? Johns Creek United Methodist Church was not D. Shulnut. It's not Sandra Jones. It's not Charlie Reed. It's not any other person who may go in that pulpit at any one time. Church is us. Folks, we are Johns Creek United Methodist. When we meet in the summer to rise against hunger, that's Johns Creek. When we comfort each other, when someone's had a, a death in the family or a tragedy, that's Johns Creek. We put on a consignment sale, we go on a retreat. Just when we have coffee in the holy grounds, that's Jones Creek. So my prayer is, is that we as a church have been going through a season of change, that now the season of change will be longer. But we're a great church, we're a great congregation, and we hope that both Sandra and our new minister have the best ministries, and we ask that all of you be here next Sunday at the reception to say goodbye to Pastor Sandra. Thank you. Join me in the prayer of illumination, which is printed in your order of worship. Guide us, O oh God, by your word and the Holy Spirit, that in your life we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and you will make us discover peace through Christ. Please remain standing as you are able for the, re for the reading of the word, which today is taken from. The first epistle of John, chapter 3, verses 11 and 16 through 24. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. And we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little, little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. 
and by this you will know that we are for the truth and will reassure our hearts before him. Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God and we receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the spirit that he has given us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Join me in thanking Sawyer for reading that scripture so beautifully today. She wanted to do a great job, and she asked me before worship, had I ever read that before? Had I done it before? And I told her that she had everything she needed, and that she was smart and beautiful and wonderful, and that God would, would work right through her, and he did today, Sawyer. So God bless you, sweet girl. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please join me in a prayer. God, I thank you for young people, for little children, for youth, especially our young ones. God, whose whole life is ahead of them, whose journey needs to be marked with hope and encouragement and great examples of Christian faith. Forgive us when we fail them. Bless us when we emulate you. And may they grow up knowing your love and share it with others as they proclaim and live your holy word. In Christ's name, amen. Let's keep the main thing the main thing. That is a familiar phrase. It is what John is talking about here in the gospel. It is what is needed in our churches and in our lives. I want us to understand a little context about this. The letter of 1 John is written in a time when the church is going through struggles and divisions. In fact, much of the scripture is written when the church is going through struggles and divisions. Paul's writing, which is one quarter of the New Testament, is letters to his congregations who just cannot behave. People who are divided and struggling and fighting, and he is their pastor and he loves them and he wants to give them the right direction and put them on the right path. John is doing this in the church as well, and he is writing... In his own style, I, I love John, I love how he writes. He uses phrases repetitively, he reverses the sentences and he repeats himself so that no one misses the point. He loves the phrase, the beginning. He talks about it in the gospel, in the beginning, from the beginning. He says that here as well. And then he says, abiding in us and abiding in him, and he likes to keep the phrase going in the writing that he does. There were people in the time of this early communication in the early time of the church and John was trying to communicate to the church to explain to them that what you believe about Jesus and what you do about that belief is critical it is what matters it is the main thing there was a movement within the early church of docetism d-o-c-e-t-i-s-m when people were beginning to say who were in the church were beginning to say that Jesus was not really human he was just divine he only appeared human and that created really a lot of unrest for the people a lot of confusion because the er the earliness the newness of the faith was very hard for them and so he had to deal with this in this writing to the church reminding them as he reminds us today this is the main thing that you believe in jesus and that you love one another that's the whole point. That's what we're doing here. That's why the church is the church. And these particular times, we need to remember that we're living in a time when it's harder for people to speak that love and that truth to others. We're living in a very divisive time. We have to remember this morning that there were people who were willing to die for their faith. They were willing to die for Jesus. Can we really imagine that? Can we comprehend what that means for us? We who may be too hesitant to even speak his name for fear of offending someone. God help us. People were willing to die for the faith and 
today we're unwilling to even share our faith with others, we need to keep the main thing the main thing. I remind people about this day and age of political correctness, how important it is to be authentic and faithful in our faith, be the best Christian we can be. Be at ease in sharing that with non-Christians, with people of other faith. I, I say that because I've been thinking about my dear friend Michael Bernstein, who's the rabbi at Congregation Gesher El Torah. And he is a police chaplain with me in the city of Johns Creek. And we, we talk often. We're very good friends. He's become a spiritual mentor for me in my times of need. He's been very central in my life. And so uh, I attended his bat mitzvah, his daughter's bat mitzvah, that he invited me to. It was a wonderful experience of worship. And then uh, he also invited Walter and I to their home for Seder, for Passover Seder, he and his wife, because we become good friends. And I said to him, Michael, I would love to come, but it is our Good Friday service. Now, I shared this with some of y'all before, so those of you for the second time, it's okay, but I want to make this point again. And I said to him, I would love to come because I have to tell you, Michael, you know this from our conversations. I love Jesus so much with all my heart, but I would be Jewish if it weren't for that. <laughs> and we laugh and we hug and we understand and we love each other. Today, my friends, I'm so proud of some of the leaders of our church. I had a dream of us coming together in this community for interfaith conversations. Thus, the Join Together July last year, the sharing of who is my neighbor. Michael was here for that. Tarif was here for that. And we, we end up thinking about this. We had our Hindu, Muslim, and Jewish neighbors here. Today, after church, our Committee on Religion and Race, led by Dr. Dave Brewer. Dave is a wonderful, faithful servant of God. Dave has his Ph.D. in philosophical theology with a, with a major in Islamic studies. Say that real fast. Dave is also married to the Reverend Dr. Judy Chung that you will hear preach from here, here from time to time. Their children are active in our church. I baptized Caleb and Esther a few weeks ago on their own profession of faith. Judy is the executive director of the Board of Global Ministries housed right here for the whole world of United Methodist Board of Global Ministries. They're married to each other. And they are awesome. And so Dave has worked hard. He has built a, a long-time friendship now with Tarif. And Tarif and his congregation members are coming today to our church. And my dream is coming true that we're going to sit around the table and share a meal together. And Dave and Tarif will have a dialogue, a very informal dialogue. We have to know each other because we're supposed to love each other. This is the main thing, Jesus says. This is the main thing. The work of the Holy Spirit does that for us. Last week, I was on call for the police department, and I got called to a home in a situation for a death notification, and I'm, I'm not allowed to go into the details, but I will tell you this. The precious woman that I was there to comfort in the death of her husband, when I sat down with her, she said to me, I was in full uniform, I had my badge, I had everything on, and, you know, that's a little overwhelming for some people. And I sat on the sofa with her, and the officers were outside and gave me some time with her. And I held her hands and I said, I'm so deeply sorry for your loss. And right away, she said, I want you to know that I'm an atheist, but I'm spiritual. She wanted to qualify herself to me. And I looked at her with so much love in my heart. And I said to her, honey, I want you to know something. I'm here to comfort you, not to convert you. I've had subsequent conversations with her. You see, the Holy Spirit moves in relational and timely ways you never know. And I want us to know that we never know when God is going to put somebody in our path. Keep the main thing the main thing. So I wanted to give us some illustrations today. And then this morning, I want to take us through what we call expository preaching. I don't do it all the time, but when I do it, I want you to know I'm doing it. So you need your Bibles out because I'm going to go over the verses or you can just hold your order of worship in your hand because it's printed there. And in just a moment, when I finish making these illustrations, I'm going to take us through these, these verses so that we can understand them in a particular way. 
So what are the main things that are going on in our lives? How do we prioritize our calendars, our work, our school, our recreation, our relationships above all these priorities? How do we keep our main purpose in life of loving God and the neighbor the main thing? How do we do it? How do we prioritize our relationship with him? How do we keep the main thing the main thing? Does anyone ever feel like there are too many main things going on in your life? Does anyone ever wish things could be slower and a little less hectic? Let me ask it another way. Do you love being exhausted? Do you love running from appointment to appointment? Do you love that someone's going to ask you to do one more thing and you'll just throw a party? You're so happy about it. <laughs> right, I thought so. But if we look at our day-to-day -day lives, we find ourselves filling our days and our nights, making sure that we're fulfilling the obligations of main things of other people and situations in life. And part of that's normal. I understand that. We have to deal with food and shelter and vocation, education, health, earning this income. And I will say this, since we are among the privileged in the world, we have the luxury of discussing the meaning of life. Most people are trying to just have life. We talk about how to spend our discretionary income on clothes and vacation homes and travel and jewelry and electronics and cars and so forth. I think we need to own the reality that many people in our communities are struggling with all of these expectations of these main things. They work long hours, they work hard at school or work and volunteering. They go to sleep tired, they wake up tired, and if they get any sleep at all, it's a miracle. Many have to medicate just to get to sleep and have to have stimulants all day to stay awake. Is that keeping too many main things the main thing? I wonder about that for us in this life. I wonder about how we handle that. Is that okay for you and me? And where is the voice of the church advocating for balance in our lives? I'm here to advocate today because Jesus said to remember to believe him, to share that good news and to love one another. I think people spend way too much time not loving one another in life. I think that we go through life uh, not seeing people as people, but as a means to an end sometimes. Last year, I had the wonderful opportunity to participate in two baccalaureate services in our school system here in Johns Creek, and I was honored to participate in that. And this year, because of my vacation, Reverend Brittany Sanders, our youth and college pastor, will represent our church there, which is excellent. And I remember sitting through those services when these young people would speak. Obviously, the top academic students would speak, and I noticed a consistent pattern that was disturbing to me. When young people would get up to talk, and they would talk about the pressure that they're under, they would thank some of the people in their lives but they kept talking about how hard it was and how they struggled and how difficult it was. And I get that young people need challenges and goals and they need to learn how to take their place in society. But my friends, we are living in a culture where education is out of control, pressuring our children. Our young people are going off to college and coming home because it is too hard to deal with in their lives. And I don't blame those young people. I blame a culture that is out of control with the bottom line of success and money and power. And we need to let children and young people be children and young people. When I was 25 years old, I taught preschool at Peachtree Road. We had moved here from Nashville. And I had the opportunity to do that between my appointment as a diaconal minister in Christian education and so I had a year, and I was teaching the three-year-olds and the four-year-olds, and I hadn't had children yet. And I had the three-year-olds two days a week and the four-year-olds three days a week. And in my four-year-old class, I had 20 children, and only six were girls. And as a, as a, as a person who went to 
practice and visit. We did home visits. I had two assistants in my classrooms. And I would go to the homes in Buckhead and I would visit these children, these little babies, these four-year-old children, three-year-old children. And the parents were, were doing parent conferences. We do that in preschool. Y'all know that, right? And the parents were worried about how high they were counting and how well they were doing. And, and I'm sitting there thinking, I have the degrees in education and, and in development, so I know that what they're doing is normal. But mom and daddy are putting the pressure on them because they need to get into Pace Academy or, West, or wherever they're going. They are babies. Where did that come from? Who has created this world of this level of pressure for our young people? It is literally killing them. The suicides that I have had to go to because of this pressure. The things that are happening. Friends, the church has got to be the place, the advocacy for balancing the main thing in people's lives. We've got to do it. Last year, as I think about those young people and where they are this year, as I pray for them, as I pray for our young people, we had the most awesome Senior Sunday last week. If you missed that, I'm so sorry for you. It was fabulous. And what a witness. Our young people up here giving testimony to the love and nurture they've experienced in this church, and so thank you for that. We need to encourage, we need to strengthen, we need to be positive. We don't need that kind of pressure. I want us to think about what's going on in health care. How did we go from having people to have a, a vocation, a decent living in, in the health care industry, in the insurance business, to this world that is beyond our understanding and premiums that people cannot afford Blue Cross, Blue Shield, and Piedmont had to fight over a contract. When is enough money enough money? When will we go to people being well and taking care of people so they can be well and giving medicine to them when they need it, when they're not well, to the bottom line profit and loss statement? When is the church going to be the advocate for justice in the health care field? And friends, I don't have any trouble telling you that some of my very best friends are my insurance agents. Some of my very best friends are doctors and nurses and people in the healthcare field. And whatever is going on in the industry, there are people paying a price that should not be paying that high a price. This is broken in our country. I also think about what's going on in the main things of the the sports culture. Now, I, I gave you a few illustrations today. This is one of them, and I'll be done with my illustration. But I think about the sports world. The main thing of enjoying life through recreation and play, which is important, the, the entertainment of that has turned into a machine of money and power. It is a contradiction that athletes now, people that, that cheat, that have terrible sportsman, unsportsmanlike conduct, have become role models for children. Athletes who make more money than the teachers who taught them. I think something's broken here. And I remember when worship was the main thing. And you didn't do anything on Sunday except Jesus. Does anybody remember those days? They're not coming back. Because the culture and the expectation of that is the main thing. And it's fascinating to me because I really did think it was supposed to be about health and wellness and fun and play for our children. I went to our little granddaughter's, she's three and a half, her soccer game last Saturday. Soccer game. And they're all the age levels out there. And we were sitting there just watching her play, just enjoying her play. And after about five minutes of trying to kick the ball, they're three and a half, remember that, they all went down to the goal net and just hung out and played with the net. <laughs> and the coach is over there calling them back to the field, come on. 
And, and then, after a couple more kicks, they went back to being not distracted. About five or six of them, my granddaughter led the way. They just sat down in the middle of the field. They were done. They were tired. They were hungry. It was a church barbecue, and they could smell it, and they were done. And just a field away was an older age level of children. And I heard the coaches yelling at those kids. What has happened to us? Who is that for? That we have turned something that God gave us, the ability to invent, imagine, and play, into what it is now. It is heartbreaking. It is not the main thing. I want us to be the advocates of balance in life and recreation as the church. And, and there are many others. We could go on and on. The book of Acts literally shows us how the church spread from person to person. The book of Acts reminds us of what it is to share and to hold all things in common. And I want us to think about all the things I've said and how did we get this way. And now I want us to look at the way we need to be in very great detail. Look at verse 11. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning. Do you hear John and his repetitiveness in a good way? But think about that, church. From the beginning, there isn't a time when God did not want us to be whole and full of love and life. There isn't a time where that wasn't the case. That we should love one another not in the simple uh, friendship or romantic love, but in the deeper, higher calling to agape love, the love that is his love and his spirit. From the beginning, I love that Jesus never changed his mind about us in spite of what was done to him, in spite of the hurt, in spite of the betrayal. He loved. That's how we have to be. When that happens to us, that is how we have to be. Love calls us to this higher place. We have to stop this culture of entitlement and arrogance and take on the humility of Christ. We have to do that, to welcome the stranger. Look at verse 16. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. What does that mean, to lay down our lives for one another? What does that mean? It literally means for us that we're willing to give up our selfishness. It means that we need to know that above all things that he calls us to see people through his eyes. Does it mean only acts of valor and bravery that shows love for one another? Friends, he died on the cross. He was betrayed. He was beaten. He suffered. He gave his life for us. So our hearts need to be like his heart, loving and forgiving. He doesn't call us to physically die, but to die to self. He doesn't want us to die physically. We're going to because that's biology. But our theology teaches us our life is to be lived in him and to be high quality while we're here and in heaven. We have to work through the experiences to love one another, through experiences of hurt and anger to be in a place of peace and forgiveness. And that is very hard work. Trust me, I know. Verse 17, how does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let us love not in word and speech, but in truth and action. We love one another by giving generously and advocating for fair and just wages, fighting against discrimination in every form, racism, classism, ageism, sexism, xenophobia, and negative bias toward the poor. Not everybody can pick themselves up by their bootstraps and get to work. You'd be surprised. To be generous and compassionate to those in need is love in action. To have business practices that are helpful. I saw a great movie called The Commuter with Liam Neeson. Anybody like Liam Neeson? If he's in it, I'm watching it. I don't care what it is. And so this latest one is called The Commuter, and he is a retired police officer who goes to work for an insurance company. He's been there 10 years, and for 10 years he rides the train, and he knows most of the people and their stories. 
And I won't give it all away because I'd like you to watch it. But anyway, in this story, he goes to work one day. He's helping his son with his homework to get him to college. His wife is working. They're all just making their life work paycheck to paycheck, he says. And he goes to work one day, and the boss hands him a notebook with his severance package. And he's, and he's talking to him, and he said, I don't understand, my numbers are great, I don't understand this. And the boss says to Liam Neeson, I know, but we just, you know, we're making this change. And it's not personal, it's just business. And all of a sudden, you see the man's mouth moving, and there's silence on his end, and Liam is having an out-of-body experience at this news. And then from there goes the rest of the story, which I won't tell you what happens. But he says it's just business, it's not personal. Anytime anybody's life is turned upside down, trust me when I say it is personal. People are more than profit and loss statements. And we as Christians ought to own that in business and in the church. I want us to look at verse 19 through 22. And by this we will know that we are the truth and we'll reassure our hearts whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts. And he knows, beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God and we receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. This is a clarion call to the grace of God. Prevenient grace, grace brought you here and into your journey with him. Justifying grace, making us right with God. And so the sanctification So we can be bold in that faith. We can ask, we can seek after his will. And I want us to know that. And then in verse 23, and this is his commandment that we should believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another just as he has commanded us. Take this verse with you all week long. I hope you will. If you don't remember anything else I've said today, remember verse 23. Because to believe in him and to love one another is the main thing. All who obey his commandments and he abides in them, abide in him and he abides in them. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit that he has given us. So I want to ask us today, as we leave this place, where are your priorities? Where are mine? Where is the balance in life? Are we telling people? Have we put people in the pew beside us to invite them to this wonderful experience of John's Creek and worship? I hope that at some point, in life, the answer will be yes. And I pray for us, I pray for us as we move into God's preferred future, that we will remember when all the other things are pulling at us, that we will keep him the main thing because he is the main thing. Let us pray. God, we thank you for your love, your life in us. We pray that we would be faithful to you, that we would be fearless in our witness of you, that we would Speak the truth in relating, loving, invitational, holy boldness ways, for you call us to that. And we ask that you would lead.